Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Sunday Morning Bible Study for July 31st, 2016. Today, Pastor Jonathan Holmes leads us as we continue discussing Martin Luther's preface and introduction to Psalm 2. Let's listen in. Well, why don't we go ahead and we'll start with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise on this day for bringing us all here safely today, especially as we have gathered together to hear your word and receive your holy sacrament. Give us that forgiveness, Lord, that we so desire. Also, at this time, we would ask that you would send us your Holy Spirit, that as we learn about your word, as we read it, that you would show us the way of our salvation, and that as through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we pray these and all things. Amen. All right, well, I'm still working at this whole what I want to do thing for Bible studies. So I have handed a whole conglomerate of questions for you. I didn't mean for it to get that long, but there it is. So we did get, however, past the first question last time. Problem, or I shouldn't say the, the problem. Answer. What was the answer? Pastor. Pastor. Because it's, it's in the first paragraph where he's discussing the teaching office. Because this is actually a lecture to one of his classes. Um, well, in 1532 that he was giving this to. So, um, yeah, the pastoral office. The pastoral office is the office of teaching, which in, which preaching falls under. Often we talk about a pastor preaching and teaching. They're pretty much in, in the end one and the same thing, especially as we have preaching and, and divine service. And so, and, well, as we can tell here, sometimes I get on what seems like a preaching tirade, so... <laughs> That's part of the teaching, I guess. So, well, yeah. That's part of the job, right? Yeah, that's part of the job, exactly. My wife often jokes that the only thing that they taught me to do in seminary was talk a lot, so. I don't know, it sounds like law school. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So then. We'll read, uh, if we could just read the first two paragraphs, kind of remind us of what the first one says, um, and then the second one. So if anybody wants to read that, feel free to do so. You can read one paragraph and move on to somebody else, or you are free to do it however you wish. Just don't do one person one word, next person another word. So that's all I ask. We're on this sheet. Yep, yep. I'll start. Um, all right. We who serve the church and, the hold, and holding the teaching office are certainly in a poor and lowly position, measured by the standard of the world against that of other professions. Uh, for we usually earn hostility for our labor and suffer not only haunting and scorn, but even hunger and want. While others are well rewarded and held in the highest esteem, we find moreover that in, for this reason men superior ability turn away from our office and follow rather those callings which are profitable and respect keep going yeah that next but, if you, but if you look at this question in the right way no matter how miserable and despised he may be the theolo theologian is in a better position than all the teachers of the other professions for as often as he performs his duty he is not only does his neighbor a valuable service which is superior to all the favors of all other men, no matter how precious or useful they may, might be. But he also offers to God in heaven himself the most pleasant sacrifice and is truly called the priest of all highest, of the all highest. For everything that is theologian, does in this church is related to spreading the knowledge of God and to the salvation of us. By the grace of God in the abdomissions. So we can act, actually we can stop there. Okay. Stop. Right now. Um, the next question on there. Does Luther say that this preaching office that we just kind of talked about well, last week and shortly here, does he call it the highest of vocations? Not from a worldly point of view. No. Not in a worldly point of view, that's for sure. Well, 
but it also it, it does kind of point out maybe not as directly as I was thinking that it was when I wrote this question but he does say that it is a service vocation and so in other places Luther actually talked about the pastoral office as the lowest of vocations because we are in service to all people um, so when a pastor comes along and lords this office over you humble him and tell him this is a service office not a, a power office um, I'd like to get, get that across because there are some people out there who think that the pastor is this on pedestal very high he's just supposed to be the best Christian through the, in the entire congregation forgetting that he sometimes falls at times he is a sinner at the same time and so just like any other vocation though it is a service vocation for the neighbor. This just offers the service of forgiveness and justification. Well, Jesus made that point in the Last Supper. Oh, yeah. By washing the disciples' feet. Exactly. This and that's is what it's about, boys. Yeah, exactly. That's a good... I wasn't thinking about that. That's, that's very good because Jesus becomes the servant. Um, in fact, I think it's in the Te Deum where it even mentions that Jesus came in the form of a servant, in the form of a man. Um, that's why, like, when the... Uh, in the creed, if you go to some really high church places, they'll often bow at the point where Jesus is, and he became man. Um, because that's... It's not so much that it's, it's, his, it's his glory, not that he became man, but he came in as a man, as a servant, low, the lowest of all people. And we would see that then with the crucifixion, especially when he's on the cross, nails through his flesh, taking away the sin of the world. When he first enters this, this uh, dimension, he comes as a helpless baby. Yeah, the in lowest, the lowliest of all the states. Yeah, because he is he is still helpless at that point. So when it comes to setting the standard, he's the king. Make an example. Exactly. So yeah, that last sentence I think is where I was getting with that la that second part of the question. But everything that a theologian does in the church is related to spreading the knowledge of God and to the salvation of men. So it is helpful for the neighbor. Um, I'll just go ahead and read that third paragraph for us. Uh, By the grace of God, the abominations of the impious, the sacrifice of the papists have been done with away with, namely the mass, which the reprobate pope, gotta love his sense of humor, along with his doctors adorned with the name sacrifice. And the true worship has now been restored, that is, the preaching of the word of God, by which God is truly made known and honored. Therefore, I too, as one of the great number of priests of God, wish to take up and explain the second psalm. I do this not only to teach you and learn for myself, but also thereby to bring to, bring to God a pleasing sacrifice. For why should I not speak in this manner of the work which I am undertaking for the sake of the church of Christ? A word commanded us in the second and third commandments. For how can we use the name of God in a holier way than to instruct, our, instruct ourselves and others in the word of God? How can we better use our time and better sanctify the Sabbath in these miserable times than to mitigate the most certain and most serious perils with the consolation of the scriptures? One, uh, one sentence I want to point out Oh, one, two, three, four, five. About the sixth line down, you'll see Psalm. I do this not only to teach you and learn for myself, but also thereby to bring to God a pleasing sacrifice. Um, we often think of sacrifice as, you know, something that we have to give up ourselves, um, you know, sacrifice ourselves, which is true. But at the same time, the best sacrifice we make is thanks, thanksgiving and praise. And there's no better way to thank God and praise Him but to say what He's done. Um, there's the, we have, I don't know if you've got it, you guys have sang it, maybe not in a long while, 
but there's the canticle in Divine Services 1 and 2 that are entitled to thank the Lord because we are thanking the Lord and singing his praise because we want to tell everyone what he has done. Let us so on and so forth. And we're giving thanks for what he's done through the entire service for us. Through confession, absolution, and then through the service of the word, word and preaching, and then through the Lord's Supper. And so the best, the best praise God can receive is something like the creed, or we're just saying what he's done. It's not something we often think about, at least in my, you know, shorter than most of you, in fact, all of you's experience. Um, I never realized that until a short time ago that the greatest praise is just saying what he's done. Because he's hearing it, he's, I don't want to say he's relishing in it, but it's, it's a pleasing sacrifice to hear what he has done because of, it's for us. And then at the same time, it's confessing and spreading the gospel even if we don't realize it. So, there you go. One of the verses is something like, there's a thousand cows on a hill and they're all mine, but the words of a contrite heart is the sacrifice that he desires. I don't know right offhand what the verse of that is, but, but yeah, that goes along with it. Because it's all him. So, having almost given you the answer here, number three, the sending on what is the true worship? A couple lines above that I just talked about. The line here is the true worship has now been restored. That is the preaching of the word of God for which God is truly made known and honored. The point of worship really isn't to thank and praise God. That's a part of it. Don't get me wrong. Worship is not bowing down, but receiving. Um, the pagans, they all bow down if they worship a God. They're submitting to him and not in a good way because they're submitting to his wrath and f out of fear. Whereas Christians, we are submitting, but we're submitting to his gifts. That's why, like in Ephesians chapter 5, we hear about the relationship, the image that Paul uses, the image of the church and Christ is one of marriage. Um, we're submitting to what Christ has done for us and that's forgiving us our sins and de declaring us righteous before the Father. So also a wife submits to the husband, not out of fear and reverence necessarily, but out of the gifts that he provides. Um, our society has been very feminized, and so I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but it's really lost the goal of what men are to do for their wives. And I think we see that all over the place especially when we have so many single mothers walking around today. Not that they weren't there before, but it seems very much more prevalent than any time in our recent history as a country because fathers and husbands no longer take their role seriously. And Because women, women are striving for, for a strong male figure. And that's where as the church we need to start stepping in and saying, all right, guys, time to step up. When the, when the society starts to fail in, in certain aspects, it's, it's time for the church to step in and say, all right. Because not that women aren't great. I love, you, I love women. I'm married to one myself. She does great things for me, and I, do, I try my best to do great things for her. But when we start feminizing the society, if we look at history, that's not always the best thing that happens. Well, and God has designed a family as a male and a female because each of them brings to that relationship exactly. different strengths. Right, and there's an order to the creation in that respect because of that. Um, Adam, Adam was created for Eve in the end, and Eve was created for Adam. And so, really, all the weight is on the man to preach then 
to his family. I mean, that's why the catechism starts off as, a, as the head of the household should teach his family. And so, yeah. That consists of then of the true worship because it's offering gifts. So, yeah. And if, here, I have to say this then, we as fathers, we need to confess that we have, that we have failed. Confess as husbands that we have failed and then receive the absolution. And then as Jesus tells us, go sin no more. It's not a moralistic thing, but it's to keep confessing and receiving absolution, the life of constant repentance that a Christian is to live. So, I need to say that then about the guys. And it does happen with women. There's just a lot more of you here, so. <laughs> anyway. Um, questions? With that said, why is this important to us as those who do, in fact, worship the one true God? I think I may have, might have point this, pointed this out to a certain extent. One of the phrases I absolutely am disgusted with as a pastor, I'm not saying it for job dis- security, but you know, I always go and meet these people and say, well, I can, I can pray or praise God while on the lake or on the golf course, or while I'm driving my motorcycle, I say, that's true. But you can't receive forgiveness on your motorcycle, or in the golf course, (laughs) or on the lake. There's a reason golf is a four-letter word. (laughs) All the rest were taken, as my dad jokingly (laughs) tells me. Same with the lake. Because whenever I go on the golf course, I find more frustration than anything because I keep losing my ball and it doesn't go the way I want it to go. Same with the fishing on the lake. The <laughs> fish oftentimes don't take the bait. So I can't <laughs> participate in the fruits of my labor. My labor is in vain at that point and I cannot even feed myself. And neither my family at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, the fish are over there. Anyway, I won't get on that bag bag catch right there. So, but yeah, so yeah, we cannot, apart from the divine service, we cannot receive forgiveness. That's why we confess then in the meaning of the third article of the creed that it is in this Christian church that there is the forgiveness of sins because this is where Christ says he will be to do those things. And so that's why it's, to understand the true worship, we must understand it as God giving us his gifts. Why we do call it now, divine service um, it's only actually in recent times that Lutherans have called it worship really on a, on a day to day basis um, otherwise we've always called it the service of God to his people um, our God is very different than the natural knowledge of God in, in that he wants to serve he wants to serve us instead of receive service himself that is the true worship. It goes beyond all human reason. So, take that for as it is. All right. We'll move on to the next paragraph. Um, before I move on, any questions, comments, concerns with what has just been said? We, can, we cannot forget that there is to be praise and thanksgiving, but it's after receiving what God has given to us and saying what he's given to us. So that's why I love also the new Cominus. You know, it's the song of Simeon in the temple where he's essentially thanking the Lord for fulfilling his promise because he was told that he would see the Christ child before he would die. And so now I can depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen thy salvation for the sake of all people. A light to enlighten the Gentiles, so, so on and so forth. I'm doing the DS3 there, the old 5 and 15, but that's what I grew up with. So, but, um, but yeah, <coughs> this is actually a great canticle of thanksgiving in the end. Because I can depart in peace. All right. So then, we'll move on to that last paragraph in the preface. Um, Let us then unite our studies and labors, you by hearing, I by teaching. And so, as our calling requires, 
you shall perform this service to God, which he everywhere demands of us, so that by this discussion of the word of God, faith will be confirmed in us, and the glory of God will be increased. And I have to pause there and say that is the whole point of the office of pastor. And so this is a sacrifice pleasing and acceptable to God, with this fruit of our lips, as the prophet puts it in Hosea 14.2. He is more pleased than with all works, no matter how costly and difficult they may be. It is therefore fitting that we approach with a cheerful mind labor so holy, so necessary, and so useful. For we are certain that in so doing, we not only do no wrong, but are occupying ourselves with the most sacred labors, which will bring forth a sure and indeed an eternal fruit. So what does the labor of the theologian bring forth? according to this paragraph here. Actually, I think I gave the answer away. And I paused. Eternal, Eternal fruit. Um, I mean, that goes along with uh, our text for today that I preached on from Colossians 1, 1 through 11, not 1, 3, excuse me. Um, those things from above. Because no matter what we labor and toil in this life, that in the end is what matters, is those gifts from above, which gets, gets us from this life into the next. I'm not saying this life isn't unimportant by any means. We have vocations to fulfill and times of repentance to receive forgiveness as Christians. But in the end, everything, all the worries, all the stress, all the anxieties, all the burdens that we have bore either wrongfully or rightly, in the end have no comparison to the glory we receive in Christ. And we have, be we have begun that life at our baptism. So it started there. It doesn't start at our death. Eternity doesn't start at death. Well, all it does, just that death and being drowned and being raised out again in baptism. Not our physical death, but our, our spiritual death is where it starts. All right. Any questions about the preface? All right. Well, if it wasn't enough that he gave us a preface, which seemed like an introduction, he's going to give us an introduction now. So, um, great. We will get to the psalm eventually. Though this is an introduction fully of the psalm, so that is helpful. It's just I like people to read this, this preface and stuff like this to, to help you understand what the office is about because I am a very lowly person in need of forgiveness just as you do and the world will never see me and hence many of the people in the church because they are, so there are people who are worldly, worldly in the church will see the office as nothing because in the world it is nothing but in, etern in, in the discussion on eternity and salvation and forgiveness it means everything because Christ, it is a gift to, to the church from Christ. That's why in John 20, he breathes on his disciples. He breathes on them and tells them to go either withhold forgiveness to the unrepentant and forgive those who have repented. And so there is that command for those men called into the ministry to do that from Christ. And that's why then Paul has to discuss that further in the pastoral epistles First and Second Timothy, Titus, um, those ones right there. So. All right. Um, if somebody wants to read this first paragraph, you are welcome to do so. If not, just tell me, and I will read. I'll read. Okay. Uh, interpretation of the Second Psalm by Doctor Martin Luther. As we learn from the Book of Acts. 425. This second psalm supplied the first prayers and words of thanksgiving to God in the church of the New Testament. For when disciples were gathered together, they sang and praised God and prayed, with, and prayed that in the face of such great perils and the great madness of the adversaries, their spirits might remain steadfast and that they might preach the word with confidence. This passage is, is sufficient proof that this psalm contains something extraordinary. For the apostles had recently been filled with the Holy Spirit, 
And in their first trial or affliction, they seized upon it, pray it, and in this and in this way both console and fortify themselves against all the power of their enemies. Moreover, both are certainly necessary for us in these latter days, since for the sake of the word of God we are attacked by Satan and the world with force and deceit with various offenses and every kind of evil. All right. Have things changed at all in 500 years? No. <laughs> no. no. Um, in fact, it was probably a little bit more dire for Luther just because there was the attack of the papacy, which was the church. There was only one church at that point. And so there's a lot of power going on behind there because they don't just have spiritual, I have to use those in quotes, power, but political power at the same time. In fact, Luther... We often say that he's from Germany. Well, yes, he was from Germany as we know it today, but it was actually known as the Holy Roman Empire at that time. And so there's that. Plus, there's also the attacks from the Muslims at the same time come trying to uh, conquer Europe. And so while at the same time that was something very bad happening for the church, it was actually good because that's then where the papacy had been paying attention to um, instead of Luther. It was, he was a small and significant monk, and the threat of life and death, though, was more with the, the, the Muslims and, and Islam inf infiltrating at that time. And so, not, and so things haven't changed, again, in saying that, because, I mean, Islam is still probably the number one threat to Christians in the world besides Satan and just world philosophy. But it, it seems that the uh, the church, so to speak, had fallen into the same trap that the nation of Israel had. Oh yeah. Before with with the uh, Pharisees running things. And in some respects too, that's happening today. Yeah. Especially when we see many denominations who are still enslaving themselves to the law yeah. instead of being a slave of Christ and the gospel, which is freedom. Um, that's why I love being a Lutheran and why I get together with pastors and people as often as I can because they humble me to remember the gospel and to preach, yes, the law, to show us our sin, but to more importantly preach the gospel in order to, com to comfort souls because there is so much burdening us in this world today. You know, I, I in fact... I'll admit, when I was in Minnesota, I had lost focus of the gospel, being attacked so much by, by people, and then it going into that depression I often talk about. Um, and so I became a preacher of the law because I needed to, sh oh, excuse me, I needed to show it to those guys who are acting evil. Forgetting at the same time, the reason many people attack is because they're scared and they have no hope. We must remember that when people are attacking the church. The gospel is a stumbling block to the world because it's a law to them. Because they don't have control. And to give up control is a law to them. Whereas Christians, on this side of baptism and the gift of faith, we can say, all right, Lord, here it is. Here's my anxiety. Here's what's bothering me. You said you would take it away from me, so I'm giving it to you. And why he responds with the word, it is mine, no longer yours. So, keep that in mind as the church as well. Well, and, and for an unbeliever, you worry about all that stuff, and you really have no control anyway. Right. It, it's funny that way. I know. We, we want to control everything, and we really have no control at all. <laughs> yeah. It is human nature to want to control things. I mean, that's... That's why we fell into sin. We wanted to control our destiny. You know, I see that in a lot of movies. Even when they base, base the movie off a purely Christian-themed or even allegorical, like Lord of the Rings and um, Chronicles and Narnia, are very much Christian literature. Um, they often talk about, well, he cannot set my destiny, or my destiny is not set by this or that. I am a free man. That's actually an old church heresy called Pelagianism that talks about free will 
as I have the free will to do this, when in fact our, our, our will is actually bound to something, either to sin or Christ. Just one is actually freedom in the end. So, yeah, we have free will in, in choosing what we can eat and who we marry and those kind of things, but not when it comes to salvation, because all we have, if we go apart from Christ to say that we have free will, all we can choose is to sin, because we are fallen human beings. It's only through Christ that we can now choose good things, because it is Christ in me who is doing it. Paul tells us in his epistles all the time. So... So I hate to burst any bubbles if you thought you lived on free will. Um, in fact, Luther has a very long treatise um, called The Bondage of the Will. Exactly. It's a very long book. Very difficult read, too. The Bondage of the Will? Bondage of the Will, yeah. Sin is chains. Sin is chains. Sin is bondage. Mm-hmm. Um, you slave to sin until you grab God's will. Oh, yeah. That's why... I think, I think I talked about it this past Wednesday. I don't know if it was the morning section or the evening section, but we talked about how, um, and maybe it wasn't even there. I talked with somebody about it. Um, the freedom of the gospel is being able to do things that people say that we can't do them. And so in response, we do it the opposite way. Baptism is a perfect example. Um, there are churches out there who say that you, the only way you can baptize is by, and I say this um, half-heartedly, putting them in the dunk tank and putting them all underwater. There is no command in the scriptures to do such a thing. That's how they used it, because all they had was the river or a pool, so we, that's the only way that they could baptize. But as soon as you part, start putting a, that that is the command to do that, we must do it in an opposite way. That's what the way we Lutherans do it. It's a commitment of the heart. Right. Because we are not enslaved to a command that is not given. Right. We are only enslaved to what is commanded in the scriptures. Right. And not even enslaved to it anymore because through Christ we are set free from the law. The uh, thief on the cross who was saved by Christ right. was never baptized. And today you will be with me in paradise. Heart was changed. Yes. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, he baptized with he, fire. He wasn't dunked in the river. Too late for that. But it wasn't too late to give his heart to Christ. And that's why, you know, they, they always, people always come back, well, the guy wasn't baptized. Did he go to heaven? Well, you're right, Chris. Mercy of God. God is merciful tell and just. Jesus that he didn't do it right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. Um, I hate to tell you this, but yeah, Jesus... There was actually one guy he said specifically that didn't go, that, that uh, went to heaven and not while not being baptized. Now, we don't make that the rule because there are commands to baptize. I mean, the great, what we call the Great Commission is really the great sending of the apostles to go baptize and teach all that I have commanded you. So there is that aspect, and there are special circumstances. We just can't make that the rule because too often... You know, we get to be like, a, well, perfect example in church history is Constantine. The, the great Christian emperor wasn't baptized until his, until his deathbed. He could have died any time before that, but he waited till his deathbed to do it. That's testing God in the wrong way, yeah. if you ask me. Sure. So, at least that's the tradition, the tradition, tradition that is held that he didn't, he didn't wait until his death. But I hear about that all the time, too. There's other stories about church history, the same thing. So, yeah. Because with baptism, we have the assurance now. As I said in our sermon, we have the assurance. When we remember our baptism, we, we can then remember the promises of God. Um, so, as Luther says, when, when you wash your face, remember your baptism. When you see water, remember your baptism. When you drink water, remember your baptism. For that is what has purified you with the word. So. You ducked out great and hard. So, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. When you yeah, when you're hitting the right wave, or even the not the right wave, <laughs> when you go under, that's right. Remember your bat. Yeah, remember your baptism because that may be your last moment. Yeah. Anyway, exactly. yeah. Almost happened to me. Pretty big reminder. Yeah, pretty big reminder. Exactly. 
Especially if you're surfing in Hawaii. That's Hawaii. Mm. Those big waves in Hawaii. Those big waves here. They hit you harder because the water's dense and it's cold. It's cold. Oh, yeah. It's heavy water. It is heavy water. Hawaii's not a Because, yeah, when it hits you... <gasps> Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, there's that discussion. <laughs> so we'll come back to question one well, of the I'll intro. Bible study of faith, sidetrack city. Yeah. Hey, that's what this is. What it, we're here to learn. We're not here to just get through it in four to six weeks. We're here to to learn. We're we're here to. There's always a great contribution. Oh yeah. We can't be distracted by time. His time is finite. This is eternal. Thanks for listening to this Bible study presentation from Faith Lutheran Church in Moore Park, California. For more information, visit us on the web at faithmoorpark.com.